church. We'd love to invite you guys to stand and sing these first couple songs with us. Second morning in Sydney, she's going to lead this first song for us. See so where you go, I'll go. Happy Sunday. Uh, I did this the last service, so I got to do it this time too. Go Vols. We did it. We, we won a game. We did the sports. We got the points. Uh, <laughs> I don't sports, dude. Um, take a minute. Say hey to those around you. We'll get started in just a little bit.
guys could be seated. God, we just thank you for that this morning. We thank you for saving us from death and giving us eternal life, God. God, that we can come to you with all of our problems, all of our worries, all of our fears. God, everything that's broken in our lives, Father. And you would just make all things new, God. We don't deserve it. We'll never understand it, but we thank you for it, Father.
that your yay dance? <laughs> asking parents and teachers and coaches and counselors to do something totally different. My name's Brent. Hi, I'm Clay. My name is Rachel. Hey, everybody. My name's April. Ma! I'm loud. I like getting alone time. Gas stations are very sketchy. Does everything have to be a competition? And I'm like, yes, and I'm <laughs> going to win. It is oh. uncanny how her stomach aches <laughs> coincide with we need to clean up the kitchen. With my students, I want them to pay attention and um, take my lead. He said this, I said that. Why would he say that? Did I say this wrong? Every word you speak should be a gift to the person that you're speaking to. I like hearing good things about myself from someone else. I like to hear, like, good job, well done. Those little comments stick with me all the time. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Mm. That's a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> <laughs> It's a framework of communication that has the power to change every single conversation that you have with a child. If you learn this approach, discipline will be easier. Mm -hmm. Teamwork will be easier. Parenting will be easier. Teaching will be easier. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Good morning, church. <laughs> Glad you could be here. Uh, what, real, a quick word about the video. Uh, a couple Sundays ago, we had an event held in this room right here, and we had a uh, speaker come and, and kind of break down just this, uh, the temperament style explained in the book, I Said This, You Heard That. Uh, and from that, uh, from that event comes this, uh, a, a breakout, a curriculum, uh, some classes to take based on a grown-up's guide to kids wiring. Uh, like the video said, uh, this is something that could immediately improve your communication with young people, whether you're a parent, a coach, a teacher, uh, you just have kids in your life, nieces, nephews, whatever. Uh, as, as a dad of a five and a 10 month old, uh, man, it was immediately applicable to go home and be able to talk to my child in a better way that she was responding to. Uh, so I can say from personal experience, this is worth your time. This is worthwhile. This is a great resource, uh, not only for kids, but then also for adults or, or if you're a part of a team, uh, if you are married, if you're in sort of any relationship, if you're around people, if you talk to another human being, uh, this is a resource that could absolutely benefit you. So we hope that you'll check that out and you can start engaging in those classes uh, Immediately, uh, this Wednesday, uh, they begin. And then if, you, if Wednesdays don't work for you, starting in October, we'll be offering that on Tuesdays as part of our community nights. Uh, that happens right here on our North Campus every Tuesday night as well. So we hope you'll check that out. Hope you'll consider that. And again, immediately beneficial uh, for anyone that communicates with anyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Josh and I'm director of Cokesbury Students. And I'm gonna take a moment here to just dismiss our kids. Uh, and there's a special dismissal today. So if you are in K through four, we hope you'll head that way. Uh, but for the first time, if you are in 56, fifth or sixth grade, we are also dismissing uh, from the 1115 service. And I know that that may not seem like a big deal if you don't know much about 56, but uh, 56 has been around for about five years now as part of our church. And for the first time, we are dismissing kids in the 1115 service. Uh, we had only offered that at 10 o'clock, but it had gotten to the point where it's just like, this is an unsustainable number. Uh, so we're trying to break that up, alleviate one service and offer it in both. So this is a big day for us. Uh, so tell a friend, uh, maybe you're here or maybe you would prefer to come to the 10 or whatever your situation is. But now if you have a fifth and sixth graders, the offering is the same at both services. So it's a big day for us. We're really excited about it. Uh, so if you know a fifth or sixth, okay, yeah, there we go. You can clap, thank you. Thank you for sharing in my joy, uh, our joy today. Uh, so this is a big deal. Uh, another big deal uh, is uh, giving and tithing as part of our worship. And we do consider that as an act of worship because that is a gift, that is releasing of something, that is offering something up and asking God to, to take more with that uh, and to support those that are in need or to proclaim the name of Jesus uh, to those who maybe haven't heard him yet. So that's what we hope to do. And we're gonna... Uh, 
We're going to take an offering here in a moment. Uh, a basket is going to pass you by. If that is not your preferred way of giving, there are many other ways to do that. You can give online. You can give through the app. There are drop boxes uh, located around the building. You could also mail in your offering if that is your preferred way. Uh, but whatever you do, we're going to pray over those, and we're going to ask that the name of Jesus is glorified uh, in our world, in our community, in our city. To do that, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to come together with friends, with family, be part of this community. And God, in these next few moments, just allow us to feel your spirit. Maybe there's a heavy heart here. God, may we be light for the next few minutes. God, maybe there's a joyous heart here. May we just continue to rejoice with you in these next few moments. God, in this sacred space, may we worship the name of Jesus and take these gifts, multiply them so that Jesus may be known to more. In your name I pray, amen. morning. Everybody doing all right? My name is Mark, and it's good to be with you. I'm one of the pastors here at Cokesbury. I do a lot of work with uh, recovery, and um, we have started, we started last week, actually, we have started a series on the 12 steps that I think are going to be helpful to a whole lot of us and um, provide a lot of structure for the way we see things and understand things. So I would encourage you to be a part of that on Thursday nights or just watch you know, watch what we're doing. We do everything online as well. And um, it's, just, it's just interesting to watch people move their way through the steps. You know, we start off with this lovely concept in step one that talks about, I think I really am powerless, you know. And I mean, honestly, it takes most of us over a year to actually believe that, amen. And we kind of like work with that idea. We hear that idea. We hear that concept, but it's hard for us to be able to understand what that means for us. And it creates a a vulnerability in us that is necessary, healthy, but also tough, you know. So if you get a chance to be a part of what we're doing with recovery, I think you'll uh, get a lot out of it. We are um, we're working on a series, and, and today we're talking about this, this piece of it. Tell me what has your attention. Tell me what has your attention. I want to thank people that are joining us in Johnson City. Give it up for those guys for a minute, if you would. And if you're joining us online, welcome. Let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, tell us about how much you love us. We need to hear it. Tell us about how you move in our lives. We need to hear us. Tell us about being free. We need to hear it. Tell us about hope. We need to hear it. Tell us about healing. We need to hear it. In your sweet name we pray, amen. So I want to tell you a little bit about my weekend, last weekend, it was Labor Day weekend. You would think it was relaxing and easygoing. Really not so much. So um, our oldest daughter, they have two boys, and she tells me a couple weeks ago, you know, Dad, I think I'm going to have this baby on um, Friday. And I'm thinking, we have this wedding we're doing also on Sunday. Why would you, I'm not saying this, of course, but I'm going, why would you do this on Friday? And she, of course, she goes on to go, well, I mean, like, the thing is, like, when your daughter is having a conversation like that, it's like trying to stand in front of a train, amen? Why would you do that to yourself? She goes, yeah, you know, like, the boys, the boys are two and four, let's get that straight. The boys are going to be out of school, but they'll be back on Tuesday. They'll be totally back on track. I'm thinking, no, they won't. They're going to have this little girl. They're not going to know what to do with her. But they'll be totally back on track, and it'll all be good, and they'll be in school, and everything will go right. Don't you agree, Dad? I'm thinking, bite your lip, Mark Beebe. Just go, sure, honey, whatever you think is best, you know? But it's like, I really didn't necessarily think that, you know? So here I am. It happened, of course, anyway. Here I am, and uh, I'm driving to Chattanooga on Friday morning, and we're driving to this wedding, which was going to be on Sunday. While I'm talking to my daughter and her husband, who is kind of blindsided with the whole deal right, right about then, like he always is, like we all would be, right? He's not really exactly sure what he's supposed to do or exactly how it's going to go or exactly what to say, but he's making an attempt, which I'm proud of him for that because that sounds a lot like me. And I mean, we're driving down there to Chattanooga, and she's giving me the blow-by-blow blow of what's happening while she's in labor. And I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, 
this might be a narrative I, I could kind of hear like after the fact a little bit, you know, like, but no, she was gonna give me the blow by blow most of the way. She's explaining to me that she can see along the way while I'm driving to Chattanooga, she's going, well, I mean, dad, like there's sin, we can see, can see the baby's head. I'm like, get off the phone, honey, what are you doing? You know, but I'm like, I wasn't really sure what to do. It's like, uh-huh, like that's going on. So she's having a baby. Then we get down to Chattanooga and our other daughter, our youngest daughter is getting married. And so that, that part all worked out. Like she got out of the hospital Saturday, everything went great. Textbook delivery, everything perfect. Everybody happy. You know, here we go. Then we get to um, the rehearsal and all that stuff goes well on Saturday. Then we get to Sunday. And of course, it's raining in Chattanooga like it was here. It was raining on Sunday, right? Last Sunday, you remember? It was raining there like cats and dogs, right? And so then you have our youngest daughter trying to explain to us that she really didn't think this wedding was gonna work out because I mean, like, it wasn't supposed to rain. Which is why I'm about to say something important. Like, I really think what we should do in the future is ban all weddings from being outside forever so this doesn't happen. And say, on the off chance that it's a really nice Sunday, maybe we'll have it outside. But let's start off thinking about the fact that it's gotta be inside. So it got to the point where someone was walking up to me going, well, listen, I'm like, do you think it might be all right if we like, if like did the reception first and then like, you know, dinner and stuff? And then like, we could always go outside and have the wedding because that way it might work out. I'm like, no, it's not gonna be all right. Let's just have the wedding. You know, like they're not, like my oldest daughter goes, you know what, dad? When we got married, I honestly don't remember the wedding anyway. I really don't remember. It's like, oh, that's, that's nice to know when you spend $100 million, you know, like that you never remember the freaking wedding anyway. Really want to hear that? No. But she's trying to explain to me while she's in labor that she didn't really remember her wedding. I'm thinking, yeah, I really, I really didn't need to know that. You know, and so like then I got that going on with our, with our youngest daughter and she's like all about, can we delay the wedding? Or you know, somebody else is asking me, do I think we could delay it an hour or two? It's like, no, we're gonna have the wedding first and then we're gonna have the reception and it's all gonna be okay. We got in pictures, that was, that was crisis, right? That was good. Like God stopped the rain long enough, or someone did, for us to be able to have pictures. So all that was kind of like my weekend. And let me just tell you, when I got up Monday morning, I was never so happy to pack my little bag and drive my little self up to Knoxville and have that wedding kind of be where it was. It was, everyone's had fun, it was great, it all went great, but I probably, all that to say, I probably wouldn't recommend having a wedding and a baby on the same weekend, amen? Probably would not, if you're wondering if that would be a good thing to do, I'm here to tell you probably not. You know, what I really loved is my oldest daughter goes, well, you know, I was there a couple weeks ago, and she goes, well, daddy, you know what, like, maybe, maybe the more I think about it, maybe it would have been better for us to kind of like, you know, uh, wait a, um, a couple of months to have this baby, meaning it would have been like in November. I'm like thinking, you think? You think that maybe that would be a good idea? I didn't say that, of course. Like all the things you want to say as a dad, you learn along the way, right? Don't ever say them, especially when your daughter is, you know, completely in every way imaginable, pregnant and ready to have this baby. Don't say anything. Just smile and be completely agreeable to whatever it is anybody wants to talk about. That's kind of what I've learned. So, Let's move on. What has your attention this morning? What has your attention? Here's Jesus. This is difficult stuff to read. Here's Jesus. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you want to go. Jesus replies, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. Meaning, the destination, in a lot of ways, what that's saying is the destination that Jesus wants to take us to isn't really a home for us. What he's really trying to say to us here is, I want to be your home. We'll talk about that in a minute, but he's saying, I want to be your home. Don't think of your home as a physical place. Don't think of your home as a philosophical place. Don't think of your home as a place of knowledge. I want to be your home. It's going to be active. It's going to be different. It's going to be challenging. I want to be your home. Jesus goes on. He said to another person, come and follow me. The man agrees, but he says, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. This is hard. Jesus says, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. 
Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go say goodbye to my family. Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That is hard stuff, isn't it? Like, look at those three vignettes. Every one of those are really, really difficult to hear. And you want to kind of like go, well, they got to make sense some kind of a way. It's like they make sense in a lot of ways. And the first way is they're all difficult. They're all challenging. And they all take you to a different place than comfort. The radical investment of Jesus in every one of those stories is always in us. The radical investment of Jesus is always in you. And for every one of those, all those people that were hearing that, that day, what Jesus was trying to say to them is, is I want to just have you put your attention and put your focus onto me. Because what you think is going to make you comfortable, what you think is going to make you secure, what you think is going to keep you safe, in the end, it isn't going to do it. It isn't going to be enough. That's hard stuff. We go on and we get into another piece of this, which is there isn't an easy out here. There isn't an, uh, an easy way to understand this here. There isn't something that's gonna, that's gonna make it all come together here, that's gonna make us go, oh yeah, you know, like we, we, can feel, we can feel really good about this. Everything about what I just read to you is a challenge. As they were walking along, someone says to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you wanna go. Jesus says, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests, but the Son of God has no place to even lay his head. What Jesus is saying is, the home that you want to be home, the security that you want to have as, as ultimate security, the place you want to go to where you can go, now I have finally arrived, it doesn't really exist because what I want to talk to you about isn't teachings, but I want to talk to you about a relationship. And the relationship I want to talk to you about is with me. Like, this isn't about Christian teaching. This is about walking into a relationship with Jesus. This is about being challenged by him every step of the way. It's like, it's like um, my daughter's husband, when I go see them, I go see them over the weekend, just last weekend, right, like yesterday. And I'm looking at three, two boys and the daddy. And like all three of them are trying to look at this little girl and they're dumbfounded. They're not really sure what to do. They're like completely enamored with her. They're completely taken with her. It's like, right, I want you to think about the way that feels right now. It's kind of always gonna feel that way. Like you're always gonna be a little bit, a little bit offset by how different she is, by how unique she is, by how she's not like you in any way. That's always gonna be somewhat stunning for you. And like for us, it's kind of like when we follow Jesus, if we choose to do that, and like, I'm glad, if you're, I'm glad if you're here today and you're not a Christian. You don't have to be a Christian to come here to a place like this. I'm just really glad you're here. I'm really glad you're here. And it's kind of like, like though, when we get introduced to Jesus, there's always gonna be stuff about walking with Jesus. There's always gonna be stuff about being led by Jesus that's gonna be unsettling, amen? There's plenty of stuff that's gonna be absolutely unsettling. Everything Jesus talks about right there is unsettling. I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus says, foxes have dens to live in. Birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We want to be able to say to Jesus, we'll follow you around as soon as this is done, as soon as I bury my dad, as soon as I say goodbye to my family, as soon as I get my ducks in a row, as soon as I get things in order. Let me ask you a question. Is it true that your relationship, if you have one right now, that your relationship with Jesus all came to you in a nice, neat package, in a nice, neat timetable, with a nice, neat agenda, with nice, neat stations, you know, where you grew in order? Or is it true that everything about the day you met Jesus Everything about the day that you decided you would give your life to him, everything about the day that you decided that you were gonna give him that level of authority over your life, if you've done that, every single, every single thing about that was unbelievably unsettling. Because see, the thing is, that's what makes this scripture so hard. The thing is, nothing about living with Jesus is convenient. 
right? Nothing about living with Jesus is convenient. It's kind of like the stuff you want to go, well, you never really want to talk about that. Jesus is like, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. You know, you have a friend like that probably, right? Who you, you want to be with them, but they make you nuts because they always want to talk about everything. Well, you kind of want it to go away. And Jesus is that guy. Jesus is like, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's learn from it. Let's see if we can really get down to the bedrock of what's happening here. Nothing about Jesus is ever going to be convenient. He says to another guy, come and follow me. The guy agrees. Lord, first let me go home and bury my father. But Jesus tells him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Do you think that Jesus is saying, Christians have no business grieving? He's not. Do you think that Jesus is saying, Christians have no business experiencing deep loss in their life? He's not. What is Jesus saying? He's saying there's got to be the activity of life that occurs inside of us, that keeps moving on us, that keeps helping us to deepen our understanding of what just happened. There's got to be that infusion of life that's going to take us to a place where we move forward and not backward. Like, there are people that I have met, plenty of them, who can say to me, you know, my best day in my life was 10 years ago. The best day of my life was 10 years ago. The hardest day in my life was when I got divorced from this person. The hardest day in my life was when I lost my mom, when I lost my dad, when I lost my brother. And when you hear that person talk, you're like, yeah, they're stuck. They're stuck because they're not going on to say, and this is what God has taught me about grieving, grief, losing stuff so far. Like where I am is I'm stuck. I'm 10 years ago. Jesus is in the business, the singular business, of saving lives. My question is this, what, what do you guys think is more important than that? What is it that he could be doing that is more important than that? He's in the business of moving people forward, taking a deep, hard look at what happened, getting all the way into our hearts, getting all the way into our emotions, getting all the way into what's broken in us. He's into all of that, speaks to all of that, has influence over all of that, and then he finally says to us, you know, it's time for us not to forget, but it's really time for us to go. Eventually, it's time for us to go. Maybe, maybe, telling us, maybe he tells us that two years later. Maybe it's three years later. Maybe it's five years later. Eventually, what you're going to hear from him is, it, it's time to go. Will you go with me? There's a, 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 there's a reality of what grief is like, and then there's an invitation Will you go with me? Can I begin to heal your heart? Most of what's true about us when it comes to grief is we suffer with broken hearts, don't we? Somebody along the way, something along the way, maybe it was the day I got fired, maybe it's 100 million things, but something along the way, losing somebody, something along the way broke our hearts. And Jesus is like, I'm here to be the heart healer. I don't know if your heart's been broken, probably has. I don't know what broke it. But I know this, I know that there isn't, there isn't a singular experience where Jesus would say, I just took a look at your heart and I don't think I can heal it. I don't know what to do with that. There isn't a heart in this room that Jesus can't heal. There isn't a heart in this room that Jesus can't heal. He's in the business of saving lives. And can we name one thing that's more important than that? I think the hard question is this one. Do we want to try to live the rest of our lives out of a monument? Do we want to live the rest of our lives out of a monument? Or do we want to live the rest of our lives out of a beating heart? Because the beating heart belongs to Jesus. He wants to share it with us. If we want to live out of a monument, what it means is we're going to be perpetually stuck. It isn't that we're in the process of grieving. It's really that we're in the process of avoiding. It really isn't that we're in the process of moving forward and healing. It's that we're doing exactly the opposite. We're stuck. What gets us stuck? Well, ultimately, what gets us stuck is the false belief that we ought to be able to get out of this on our own. We ought to be strong enough, smart enough, whatever enough to be able to get out of this on our own. And so we remain distracted. We remain out of order. We remain confused. We remain feeling like we ought to be in charge, but we're not. 
I started, the stuff I started on Thursday night is about the hardest thing you're ever gonna get to with recovery. It's the very first step. It says, I know myself and my life to be powerless over A, B, or C. I'm powerless over it. Like, I don't wanna say that. You don't wanna say that. None of us wanna get to a place where we go, I'm really powerless over this. I'm powerless over what's gonna happen next. I'm powerless over being able to heal my broken heart. Is my broken heart gonna be a monument? Is that what I'm ultimately gonna pay attention to? Is that what I'm ultimately gonna do with myself? Is every year, every half a year, every whatever, I'm gonna grieve my broken heart? Is that what Jesus is really offering me? Or is he offering me a lot more than that? My mom used to have a way that was kind of unexplainable. You could be in a conversation or in, in, a, piece, in a, set of, a set of painful experiences or something could have really gone wrong in your life. You could have had, it could have been a million things. It could have been uh, not the best grade on a test. It could have been something your brother said, something your sister said, somebody that hurt your feelings. It could have been a lot of things, but when I was a, when I was a little kid, you know, you, you, you know how it is, like you've seen little kids try, cry uncontrollably over stuff that to you doesn't make any sense, but it's critical to them. Crying, 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 and eventually my mother would show up, and she would raise your head up, and she would say, look at me. Look at me. That was like a showstopper. She would like, look at me. She would go, you know, I, I want you to tell me all about it. Like, tell me that that isn't something of what's going on here in this story with Jesus. Isn't Jesus saying to us, let's take the hardest place in your life, the most difficult place in your life. What I want you to do is, I want you to look at me. And I want you to tell me everything about what's hurting. I want you to tell me everything about where the pain is. I want you to tell me everything about what's holding you captive right now. Look at me. So when my mom would do that, you would probably cry and you would tell her all the stuff that happened and how bad it was and all that. She would never tell you it's not that bad. That was the key. She would always take you seriously. She would never tell you you're being an idiot, you're being a dummy, you're being a fool. She would never tell you boys don't cry. She would never tell you that. Like you never heard that in my family. But when she said, look at me, you knew that what she was gonna give you was more than what you had at that moment. When Jesus is going through every one of those three scenarios, and they're all difficult, he's saying, look at me. When things get so tough, when they get so hard, when you don't have any other options, when you don't know where to go next, when you don't know what to do next, when you feel like you're 100% stuck, look at me. Let me love you. Let me take care of you. Let me show you how I can heal your broken heart. Look at me. Another says, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. Jesus told him, anyone that puts a hand to the plow and then looks back isn't fit for the kingdom of God. What he's really saying is, you're not gonna be able to accept the kingdom of God as long as you think you are the kingdom of God. Jesus is trying to separate us and our pride from thinking that it's all about us to realizing that he's coming to us and he's saying, you know, talk to me. Tell me what's going on with you. Look at me. Because when we look into the eyes of Jesus, what do we see? When we look into the eyes of Jesus, we see hope. When we look into the eyes of Jesus, we see healing. When we look into the eyes of Jesus, we see wholeness. When we look into the eyes of Jesus, we see possibility when we see a certainty of love, a certainty of love. Like, I might not know, I might not know how to heal. I might not know what it's gonna take for me to get better. I might now not know what to do with my pain, but I know at least when I'm looking at him, I'm at least knowing that he loves me, that he loves me. In Jesus is life, and that life was the light of people, 1 John 4. In Jesus is life, and that life is the light of the world. See, like, Christian teaching is great stuff, but Christian teaching without the core, and without the core being Jesus and the life of Jesus, that we carry the life of Jesus around, 
And that, that's just good teaching. But it's not explosive stuff. It's not gonna move you from here to here. It doesn't do that. Life teaching does. When Jesus says, I have life to offer you, he does. The story of Jesus is always gonna be an urgent story, isn't it? There's urgency to what he's saying in those three pieces of this. There's urgency that deals with grief. There's an urgency that deals with readiness to pay attention. There's urgency that deals with not looking back. All those are big, critical pieces of how to live your life in a way that's free and full and complete. They're all important. Jesus says, I'm here to make your value set completely new. I'm here to make everything about your value set new. I'm here to completely change the way you think. I'm here to change the way you see things. I'm here to change the way you feel. I'm here for you to understand something as simple as this. Failure isn't always failure. Sometimes when you fall flat on your face, you actually learn what it's like, what it's like when you're on your face. And you learn that sometimes actually being on your face in front of Jesus is not a bad idea. Because you learn that like my mom, he's gonna start to pick you up and slowly but surely, he's gonna tell you, you know, to look at him. And when you look at him, he's gonna start to speak to you. He's not gonna say, I don't know what to say. He is gonna know what to say. Like I've never had Jesus say to me, you know, I don't really, I don't really know what to say to you, Mark. But I've been picked up off the floor plenty of times. I've been completely distracted from everything about him plenty of times and been focused by his word Look at me plenty of times. And every time that I do that, every single time that I do that, things get better. How about for you? Like, you don't even have to be a follower of Jesus. You don't really have to be a believer in Jesus. What would happen if you listened to him and you started off like that? What if you could develop just a little bit of confidence in him and when he spoke to you, you would actually listen with no caveats, no, no anything, just him. Just him, just you. Sometimes that's what it's gonna take, amen? Sometimes a relationship with Jesus is one where he's simply gonna love you in the way that you actually need to be loved. And maybe you're gonna feel like he's the first person that's ever been able to do that in my life. Maybe that's the way it feels. Maybe you feel like it's 10 million miles away that anybody else in this world could love you, but he's loving you exactly with what you need. What kind of a gift is that? What kind of an unbelievable gift is that that one person on this day at this time loves you freely, fully, and completely? He has this brand new value set. And in the end, you're the value set. It isn't like... I mean, I can, tell, I can tell you all day long that, well, I mean, you know, Jesus died for the world. You go, well, good. I can go, Jesus died for, for everyone that was ever created. Good. Jesus is here to set all the world free. Good. What kind of an impact does it make when I say it a different way? I want you to understand that Jesus died for you. I want you to understand that he will never quit on you, never quit on you, never release you, from anything but the very, very best for you. That when you feel like you're completely out of sorts, when you feel like you're down in the dumps, when you feel like you're failing miserably, when you feel like you have nowhere else to go, what would happen if you started with him? Because he's starting with you. And it's so personal and it's so intense and it's so individualized that eventually when you really start to listen to Jesus, you're gonna think and feel like you're the only person in the room of thousands of people because that's the way he planned it. And that's the way he loves you. And that's the way it's gonna be. And that's the way he does it. And that's the way he's always done it. There's no quit in him. There's no quit in him. Will you let Jesus love you today? Will you let him love you today? Will you let him set you free today? Will you let him start a conversation with you where you're gonna end Trusting him, loving him, and believing him, and basically not having a plan, not needing a plan in any way. You know, like, what happens when your plans go out the window where you have an idea of what you want to do, but if it goes differently, okay. What happens? Like, who would have ever thought that a week ago Friday, I'd be driving to Chattanooga, having a baby on one side of the phone and a wedding on the other? Who plans stuff like that? It's like, 
Who creates stuff like that? How do you get to a place like that? You get there because Jesus goes, I'm in this to make all things new. I'm in this to be the light of the world. I'm in this to set you free. I'm in this to show you a life that you never imagined. That's this Jesus. That's what he's about. He will never, ever quit on you. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good piece of truth, isn't it? That's a good piece of life. That's a good piece of freedom. In Jesus' sweet name, amen. Let's pray. Sweet Jesus, you bring us to a place that we just, we just can't wait to be with you. We can't wait to learn more from you. We can't wait to be set free in a way that we never imagined. Come and be with us now and set us free. In your sweet name, amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you guys again so much for worshiping with us this morning. Let's thank Mark again for the message one more time.
We love you. We hope you stay safe the rest of your Sunday. And uh, we hope we bring back somebody with you next week. And just let them know what God's doing in your life. Let them know how they can get involved. We'll see you next time. Have a great Sunday.